Well, good afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. This has obviously been a momentous week in Indian-U.S. relations, and we're especially honored to have uh, His Excellency Arun Singh, the uh, Ambassador of India to the United States. This is, this is apparently your one little bit of a day off in what has undoubtedly been the busiest week uh, since you've uh, been ambassador here. This was, of course, Prime Minister Modi's fourth visit to the United States, the third, his third U.S.-India bilateral summit. Uh, I was particularly honored to be among the uh, think tank uh, heads who were given the rare opportunity to meet and brief, with the prime, brief the Prime Minister on Tuesday evening. The highlight of the week, obviously, was his uh, address to the joint session of Congress, the, at least the public highlight, in addition to excellent discussions with the President and the uh, nuclear uh, plant agreement that uh, has been reached. At that speech, Speaker Ryan referred to India as a pillar of strength in, in an important region of the world. Obviously, the United States and India share a great deal in common, dedication to democracy, pluralism, liberty, and uh, equality. And the Prime Minister referred to the United States as an indispensable partner and as a temple of democracy. Our panel today looks at uh, an, uh, an increasingly important uh, facet of political life here in the United States. And we're apparently, I think, the first think tank panel on this subject. It's the political mobilization of Indian Americans. Prime Minister Modi spoke of the important role that Indian Americans uh, play in our uh, democracy and in our society. Uh, and let me quote, quote him directly from his speech, connecting our two nations is also a unique and dynamic bridge of three million Indian Americans. Today, they are among your best CEOs, academics, astronauts, scientists, economists, doctors, even spelling bee champions. They are your strength. They are also the pride of India. They symbolize the boast the best of both our societies. And I think our panelists today, I think you will all agree, uh, exemplify that uh, to a T. We have Congressman uh, Ami Berra from California. We have two delegates from uh, Maryland, uh, Runa Miller and uh, Dr. Jay Jalisi. She's called the Congressman, also Dr. Berra as well. And we also have Shikar Narasimhan, who is an entrepreneur and chairman of the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders Victory Fund. Uh, who's been an active uh, participant in American civic life and also uh, an uh, economist, a housing economist in his own right. Uh, and the panel today is going to be moderated by Hudson Institute adjunct fellow uh, Dr. Mina Singh, who is an adjunct fellow here at Hudson. She's also a scholar in residence at the School of uh, International Studies at American University. She is widely lectured at uh, major universities around the world, including Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, and so forth. Her Academic background is on inter international and cross-cultural ex uh, diaspora experiences, uh, identity, cross-cultural communication. Uh, she focused uh, during her time uh, living in Israel on uh, the Indian Jewish community uh, in Israel and did some comprehensive studies on the migration experiences of uh, Indian Jewish communities to Israel. Her current project now which uh, she is undertaking focuses precisely on the engagement of uh, Indian Americans in U.S. politics and policy. So it's with great pleasure that I turn it over to Dr. Singh. Good afternoon. Namaskar. Um, President uh, Ken Weinstein, I'm deeply honored that you have made the time to be here. Uh, I also appreciate the presence of Ambassador Arun K. Singh. These are people who have many other things to do, and in appreciation of their being here, I would like to recognize them. I'm delighted to see so many people attending here. I also see familiar faces here, uh, people, young people who had conversations with me about getting fired up about joining politics there of Indian American origin. I would like to recognize Anurag Verma. I would like to recognize um, Vikram Ayer. I would like to recognize um, Jay, uh, Jay Kansara. Um, uh, Tanvir Kathawala and others, if I've 
if I cannot see you, forgive me for that. Um, I would also like to recognize Dr. Mahinder Tak, who was my first entry point into meeting young political aspirants, and I appreciate the support that she has always given, also in partnership with somebody I have on the panel here. So um, uh, Dr. Ken Weinstein actually stole my opening line about beginning with uh, Prime Minister Modi's speech, and he actually uh, spoke about the 3.2 um, million Indian Americans saying, you are the pride of India. And when he said that, the resounding applause that followed from members of America's political leadership is a sign that their constituents of Indian American heritage are indeed a community being acknowledged, appreciated, and even admired today. Their financial and professional successes, work ethics, family values are the typical staple of such appreciation. But what about influence? Not just buying and selling companies, but shaping policy, running for office, demanding from those who hold elected office in their regions. Despite the Lipsing Son's election in the 1950s and the appointment of Governors Jindal 2007, Healy from 2010, the Indian American political journey has been slow. There could be many reasons for that. First generation is typically diaspora, uh, which is looking at basic integration, economic integration, betterment for their children, and therefore politics seems to be a far cry. That was also the story for many of the Indian Americans. Uh, 1965, the Nationality Act brought in very qualified academics, scientists, engineers, and so on, who did extremely well but politics was far away from their minds. It is their children that we are looking at then, fundamentally. However, if wielding political clout is the last bastion through which an immigrant community bids for its place at the table, then I believe that the Indian American community today is poised at a key moment of transition and assertion, no longer shy of politics and shy of risk-taking. There is a generational shift too, we have examples today from across the U.S. In California, Kamala Harris is running for U.S. Senate. In Washington State, Pramila Jaipal is running for U.S. Congress. In California, again, Ro Khanna is running for Congress. In Chicago, Radha Krishnamurti, who has just been uh, endorsed by President Obama. In Louisiana, Abhay Patel, a Republican, is running for the U.S. Senate. Some candidates are quite young. In the past few weeks, I have met two very determined young women, Kesha Ram, who is running for Lieutenant Governor in Vermont, and Jennifer Rajkumar, who is running in Lower Manhattan for local office in New York. Our objective today is firstly to foreground this enhanced political buzz and hear some voices from within, which we hope will generate ideas for action, maybe even a conference. It's time, I think, to see more Indian American panels in the DC discussion circles. Secondly, to understand the policy implications of this shifting paradigm in voting, in funding, and in issue-based consolidations among the Indian American community. I have a very distinguished panel here. Congressman Ami Bera is the only Indian American currently serving in the Congress, 7th Congressional District, the furthest away from me. We are waiting to see how long he can spend here. If he has to leave early, that's because he needs to vote, and that's more important than his being here. So we will pose our first question to him. That's part of the pact. <laughs> he serves on the House, House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, and the Congressional Caucus on India and Indian Americans. Next to Congressman Bera is Delegate Aruna Miller, who has represented Montgomery County in Maryland House of Delegates since 2010. <laughs> She's a member of the Ways and Means Community uh, Committee. Um, I keep using the dates that they may have won the elections. 2010 is when she won, and as she, as she informed me, 2011 is when she joined. So if there's a discrepancy in the years I quote, it could be the year that they have won elections, as opposed to the year that they actually joined in, um, uh, in January or February. Uh, next to Delegate Aruna Miller is uh, Delegate Jay Jalisi. Uh, uh, Delegate Jay Jalisi has represented Baltimore County. 
He has represented Baltimore County in Maryland House of Delegates since 2015. He serves on the Environment and Transportation Committee as well as the Judiciary, Com uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, to my right is Mr. Shekhar Narsiman, Managing Partner at Beekman Advisors, Chairman of, is it Papillon or Papillon? Mm -hmm. Papillon. Okay, I stand corrected. And the co-founder of the Emergent Institute in Bangalore, India. He's been appointed commissioner on the President's Advisory Committee, uh, Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. He's chairman and founder of the first ever Asian American Super PAC, the RP Victory Fund, which is what we will talk to him about. He is also, in that sense, first generation uh, of the Indian Americans who came in after 1965. So he does represent another point in the history of the community here. And so uh, his perspectives are going to be very valuable as we go forward. Um, we keep hearing about the doctors and engineers and uh, tech people in the Indian American community, and we keep saying, oh, those are stereotypes. You know what? On this panel, I have two medical doctors and two engineers. <laughs> and they're all in politics. All right. So. I should also add at this point that um, I'm not a policy person. I teach uh, from a sociological perspective. I teach courses on diaspora and identity. And in the last eight years, I have been very closely um, associated with the School of International Service at American University, where I teach courses on diaspora. I've had the experience to learn from a lot of millennials, both of Indian American origin and otherwise, and discussions about how they see themselves uh, within politics in the US and how they view the world outside. I have learned much from them. I have also learned a lot from the Indian American community and through my exposure to them, uh, which has been very wide and across the country in many different regions. I've had the privilege of meeting with Indian American communities from anything like um, uh, occasions where there might be felicit uh, felicitating um, somebody who has run for office. It might be a meeting of an organization uh, like the API, which is the um, Conference of the Physicians, or the hoteliers, who are also now organized into a fairly strong lobby, and they have a PAC, and Anurag at some point will make an intervention about that as we break into Q&A. Uh, my exposure to the Indian American community and my um, uh, special connections with many of the second generation have taught me much about the way the community is evolving, changing, and shifting. And that is what fascinates me. Uh, so it is that which brings me uh, to this. I have probably by now had at least 100 interview conversations with Indian Americans on this subject. I have a little disclaimer here that our panelists on stage should not sing, signal a deliberate political leaning. To begin with, I'm not Indian American. I vote in India. So I have no political stakes in who should be at the table. There were also cancellations, and we were not able to get people who were not in town. Our, our um, panel was, was basically going to be from the vicinity because we were not doing a bigger conference, which I hope that we will do at some point. Congress, uh, Congressman Bera is the only sitting member of Congress. How could we not have him? I'm so honored that he's in town. But the others, all of us on stage here, are people who live in the vicinity. I have, of course, um, been aware of this and therefore decided that we would like to make this um, event um, use a crowdsourcing model. So I have two people in the audience who will respond with a Repub <laughs> Republican perspective. And so we will, at the end of it, have a very nuanced discussion, I hope. So my first um, uh, question um, in respecting your time, Congressman Bera, is to you. And um, I remember how your election um, generated so much excitement in the Indian American community. Your success represented a moment when Indian Americans uh, believed that their aspiration, political aspiration, was realizable. So keeping that in mind, today, as we move from aspiration to goals, you are able to see the big picture. Uh, what would you set as a five-year goal for the Indian American community to become a political force? 
I, th I think a couple things. If um, I think about my own story, you know, my parents immigrated here in the 1950s. You know, um, I was born and raised in California, lifelong um, Californian. So I grew up fully um, immersed in the American experience, but also rooted in the values that you know my my family brought with them: values of hard work, values of building for the next generation. And when I ran for, for Congress, I've run on those stories. So I've not run away from my cultural background, but I've run on that cultural background. And I think that's an important lesson. Um, because the, the, the values of family, hard work, um, building for the next generation are not Indian American values. They're American values that you know, resound. My district is less than 1% Indian American, less than 8%. Asian American, so it is you know, a, a district that is reflective of the United States. Um, it also is you know, the most evenly split district in the country, 40% Democratic, 40% Republican. So you know, I, I don't run as a Democrat or Republican. I run on the values and the things that I care about. So as we build that pipeline of the next generation, I think we have to run on who we are and what we contribute to the fabric uh, of American society. Um, so strategically, though, if we're thinking about how we broaden this, you know, something that, that I think Shaker will, will touch on, you know, within all of Congress, there's really um, 14 voting AAPI members. And really, if you want to have influence on your values, the things you care about, whether that's higher education, public education, um, you know, giving everyone a, a fair shot, you know, a, a fair immigration system, you have to strategically probably get to about you know, 25 to 30 um, members who can then move legislation in a block. So people have heard me you know, um, talk about strategically thinking about electing six AAPI members in 16, eight AAPI members in 2018, so six and 16, eight and 18, and 10 and 20. So then you can you know, get to a, a robust number of about 30 individuals with shared values, shared goals, and then you can start to influence legislation. But I think we have to be systematic and strategic. You know, in this election cycle, you just named off um, four potential Indian Americans that, that could get elected, Kamala Harris in the Senate, um, Ro Khanna, Raja Krishnamurthy, uh, Pramila Jayapal. So this could be a, a banner year in terms of expanding influence. Um, secondly, you know, Indian Americans have to, and Asian Americans more broadly, have to participate and vote, right? I mean, yeah. it, you know, certainly support candidates, but get out there and, and actually actively participate and vote. And you may see at the presidential level, and again, we'll hear from, from, from Shaker some of the, the strategies, but there are districts and precincts where the Indian American vote or the Asian American vote can actually you know, move the needle. So making sure we're recognizing those, we're reaching out to those communities, and we're actually actively um, talking to those communities, which is incredibly important. So would you have a goal of five years from now, how many in Congress? Well, the goal then, so, so again, six and 16, eight and 18, 10 and 20. So within the broader AAPI community, if we can get to um, the, the Congressional Asian um, Pacific Islander Caucus to get to 30 members, then you actually have the ability, you know, we saw 40 or so committed um, members on the Republican side bring a speaker down. So you can um, move and influence legislation on things that we care about. So the two really um, uh, important things from, uh, from your remarks that I take away, one is the importance of authenticity, which is, uh, Embracing the heritage and working with that, in your example, you say has been successful in that, and that's what you would you would urge as as an important thing is don't be somebody else that you're not, and Absolutely. and that that works with the electoral uh, constituencies. And the second thing is interesting. I will add a footnote for for people who may not be aware of the movements that are going on. That I keep using the word Indian American, but there is this. Indian American, Hindu American, Asian American identity spectrum. And people identify at different levels with that. And in terms of political strategy, there's a shift, a discernible shift among many who are strategizing and thinking consciously of where to go is to say that, yes, the Indian Americans have wealth, they have skills, they have, they have many other things going for them, but they don't have the numbers. So if you're trying to move the needle 
you have to work for strategies that help that issue. And so API is the, uh, is the, is the uh, short for Asian, American, and Pacific Islanders. Now, I know from conversations that many young Indian Americans who are politically very conscious have gone back to their parents and said, you know, you have to join API. And they said, are you kidding? What do I have in common with somebody who came from Hawaii? I'm mm -hmm. Indian. So I think those things are happening. But there is clearly a shift in many more Indian Americans who are born in the US are more comfortable with that pan-Asian identification. And we'll have more of that from, from Shekhar as we come. But these are wonderful uh, segues into um, uh, bringing the conversation to a more localized experience. And I want to turn to you, um, Aruna, now about your experience of having um, successfully contested and won. And now you've been, uh, it's your second term. Uh, at the level of getting votes and getting people to come and vote, uh, how important is heritage and does gender matter? Well, absolutely. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singh, for hosting uh, today's event. And I want to thank each of you for being here, uh, being engaged, and wanting to learn more about Indian Americans and their role in politics. So when I first got elected, it was in 2010. I actually came, I was born in India and arrived to this country in the 1970s. So you can imagine being a uh, first generation. I didn't grow up speaking about politics at the kitchen table. My parents and us were trying to, you know, fit into this, you know, as strangers in a strange world. So really what we were trying to do is integrate ourselves. So much of my adult life, I wasn't really engaged in politics until I became a citizen. And I did vote. And I remember during one of those elections, it was that it wasn't enough that I just voted. I thought I was being engaged just because I voted. I realized it took a lot more than that. It took us being actively engaged. Politics, as you know, is a context sport. So you need to go and be engaged, be active, go knock on doors for local elected officials. And that's how I got engaged, is by um, volunteering for a certain party that I represent. And um, eventually, one thing led to another, because when you volunteer and start at the grassroots level, you tend to meet a lot of your local elected officials. So I represent the area of Montgomery County, which includes Potomac, Germantown, Clarksburg region. And I do see a fr uh, friendly face here, my constituent, Dr. Talk. So it's nice to see you here. So um, when I started to volunteer with the, with the Democratic Party, I had no intention of ever running for public office. The idea of that was just so far from my spectrum of any possibility that could happen. First of all, I'm an engineer, and engineers don't typically end up in the role of uh, policy making. Mm -hmm. Um, so what happened was, because I was engaged with the local elected officials, there was an opening that came up in our area, and they actually approached me. I got a phone call, and somebody said on the other side, we'd like you to run for political office. What do you think? My immediate reaction, as gender goes, was no. Are you kidding? Why would you ask me? I'm not ready for that. I don't know what it's like to be a delegate, and I hung up the phone. So my husband, who tends to be a lot wiser than me at times, took me aside and he said, Aruna, let's talk about this a little bit. You've been a public servant your entire life being an engineer, so why is it that you wouldn't take on this opportunity to run for public office? And I said, well, you know, and I started going through all the reasons that typically go through people's mind, what if I lose? He goes, okay, that's the worst thing that can happen. What if you lose? You're not the first person to lose, and you'll get up, pick yourself up, and move on. He said, what's the best thing that can happen? I said, wow, yeah, I get to represent the people of Maryland. I get to be part of history. I get to, you know, uh, implement policy making that affects people beyond myself. And he said, isn't that worth taking a chance on? Yes, it is. So my lesson I learned from that question and the answer and the action I took is life begins at the end of our comfort zone. And so I decided to run for public office. And fortunately for me, as a woman and a woman of color, the chances of me getting elected are far 
smaller than, let's say, um, a man and you know, people of different uh, race and background. We know in this country that while women represent 51% of the population, we still are only 18% of elected office at the federal level, 24% at the state level, and governors, I think we represent 10%. So clearly we are underrepresented in this area. So in my case, I think the success of me being able to get elected the first time was because we have what's called, um, I don't know if you ever heard of this term, slating. So if you have certain members of your party that you will you know, uh, join forces together, share resources, do the mailings together, share volunteers. So that's what we decided to do in my case. As a result of that, these were elected officials that are already gotten elected. So their knowledge, their experience, their outreach helped me to get elected. So I think if I didn't have that type of support system for me, I wouldn't have been able to get elected. So I'm very grateful for the, um, you know, all the help that I received, not only from other elected officials, but the Indian American community also banded together and came out, supported me. They were excited to see an Indian American being elected in uh, Maryland General Assembly. And actually, in the entire nation, I believe Maryland has the highest percentage of Indian Americans to the state legislature. Currently, we have three, uh -huh. so we're very proud of that. So Dr. You know, uh, Jay DeLacy and Delegate Kumar Barve and myself, so we have three. So having said that, does gender matter? Absolutely it does. I don't think we are where we need to be. Does race matter? Absolutely. I think we still need to move that needle further. So thank you. Excellent. So you know, um, um, thank you for sharing your personal experience and, and so warmly and so candidly. So I don't know the importance of mentoring comes out directly because we are also trying to have this conversation to see where we can take young aspirants to think. Personal stories are very um, empowering; they're also very inspiring. But does the community need to do more to, for example, set up? Uh, networks where they can create those mentoring spaces. The ones that you found where you were lucky. You know, you were about to give up that option and then your husband said, wait a minute, and then you came around. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Indian American young people whose parents in any case are probably saying, hey, why politics? You have a job in the government. You're an engineer. Keep it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had, I've had uh, conversations with people who said, I was saying I'm going to address this big meeting of the community, and they said, you know what, why didn't you become a doctor? It would have been so nice. You know, so it goes on that way. Uh, so would you suggest that the community should be making stronger efforts at that? Absolutely. So the great thing about at least the Maryland legislature, unlike Congressman uh, Vera here, is that you can continue to be whatever profession you want, whether it's a physician, doctor, teacher, firefighter, because the Maryland uh, legislature is a citizen legislature. Oh. That means it's part-time. So January through April, we take a leave of absence from our full-time job and go serve in Annapolis full-time 90 days. After April, you come back, you go back to your regular job, and you continue to serve as a legislator on a part-time basis. So it's really the best of both worlds that you have in this role. And whether or not, you know, go ahead and be a physician or engineer or whatever field it is, policy making, I realize, affects every one of us, no matter what our profession is. And I often tell our community this. A lot of times when I meet with immigrant communities, they'll tell me, you know, politics, oh, that's so complex, it's boring. And I said, you know what? You may not be interested in politics, but politics is very interested in you. And here's why. Because from the moment you wake up in the morning, the water that you're drinking, is it clean or is it not? That's policy making. Look what's happening in Flint, Michigan. The schools that you send your kids to, are, do they have sufficient funds? That's policy makers that are making those decisions. You know, the, the roads that you're driving on, do you have the infrastructure there? Policy making. How much taxes you're paying? Policy making. And whether or not our country is at war at peace? Policy making. That's why it matters that we need to be engaged, no matter what our profession is. So thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to move uh, to uh, Delegate Jay Jalisi, uh, who has a similar experience. Maryland won elections. He's not born in the U.S., 
but not like um, Aruna, who was a little child. He actually came, he was educated and raised in India. And um, he told me a story a few days ago, which was very fascinating. He said that most of his volunteers in his area were, in fact, not Indian American. And he added a little bit more, which I want him to, to speak about here. And so I want you to reflect uh, Dr. Jalisi, who left his medical practice, by the way, of lucrative like, medical practice and, and joined politics. So I want you to reflect on the issue of acceptance, that you came in very late. So how has it been for you to be accepted at the local level, to be voted in? And what would be some of the lessons you will learn to tell young people who are hesitating? So my experience was, and this is my first term, I've just, this is my 18th month in office this, um, as having been elected to the Maryland General Assembly. Um, as Aruna said, uh, we have a South Asian caucus with Aruna and I and Kumar Barwe. Um, and my, I'm the first, I think the first immigrant elected from my county, which is Baltimore County oh. of Maryland. Um, with a very small South Asian um, uh, community. And, um, and I was active with the democratic politics, and I kept my issues which reflect or which connect with everyone, jobs, safety, and education. And my, my feeling was that um, if I talk about issues which are important for everyone, better education, better jobs, and uh, safety in our neighborhoods, it would connect with everyone, whether you are South Asian, Indian, um, uh, African American, whatever. And um, I, I ran a very grassroots campaign. Um, I was not in anyone's slate um, uh, on the Democratic Party, even though I was running as a Democrat, and um, nobody was interested in taking me on their slate or didn't think I could win. Um, so for the longest time, I think, and that worked for my favor till about two weeks before the elections, everybody thought he's crazy, he's going to lose anyway. So don't pay attention to him. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, about two weeks before the election, they realized when they started getting a feedback, and we have what's called the early voting in Maryland. Uh, when people started showing up for early voting, they realized that everybody wanted to have a picture taken with me on early voting centers and nobody else. <laughs> And obviously, I'm not that good looking, so it must have been my work. Right? <laughs> so every, and especially the kids, and that was because I had so many signs out on all the Desi gas stations uh. Uh, that I had almost become a small celebrity in my district. And so every child would drag his or her mom over to me and say, I want to have a picture taken with him. And, and then obviously mothers never deny their kids whatever they want, so they would have a picture taken with me. And then I started uh, giving a little assignment to their kids, make sure your mom votes for me inside. And the, <laughs> and the mom would take the kid inside in the polling booth, and the kid would come out and say, oh, my mom voted for you. <laughs> and so that, and that's when people realized that I could actually win. Uh, and so I won the Democratic primary. I got the highest number of votes. Um, of any freshman running, and I had nine people running in that election for, for, for three seats, but really there were two because there was an incumbent. And then after I won the Democratic primary, then the pri Democratic Party refused to take me on their slate, uh, and they formed a slate with other people. And I ran again, alone, and I won again. <laughs> and, uh, and so then they realized that, you know, this guy really has some grassroots game. And here's how I did it, and I think anybody can do it, it's not rocket science, is you go and talk to the people. So of the nine people running in my race, I door knocked, that's every door. I think uh, between the nine people and I, I did more doors, I talked to more people, I did more community events than anyone else, or all of them combined. And that's what makes the difference is how you interact with people. You can have the biggest war chest, and we saw this in Maryland, a governor's race, that, um, that the losing candidate had three or four times more money than the guy who's the governor now. It's not about the money. It's about the issues. It's about your compassion for what you want to do. And people can see through you whether you are sincere or just making up. And in my case, it worked, and, and I continue to do this, and that's how I've maintained uh, my relationship with my community, uh, which is my electorate, that I never, people say you never ended your campaign. It's been 18 months, and since I've won, I've done eight town hall meetings. Nobody's doing it. 
I have done two community events in Annapolis, which Aruna has been in, in them, and they have always been packed. And every event I did I have done so far in my district has always been packed. And that just shows people usually don't like to come to political events. Mm -hmm. They come when they feel connected to you. And they, each of one of my events um, is always, always packed, and I'm really grateful. And I also pay attention, and I go across religious lines. I'm the only Muslim of South Asian descent in any, um, in any elected office, whether it's state assembly or federal. So, uh, but I go across, and so my main support really comes from churches. And of the 200 people who worked on election day in the primary, because that's it's a heavily democratic district, so that was my real election. I think three were Indian Americans. Um, and 197 were, um, were, were from churches, different churches. And I went to the churches, and they were doing prayers for me, and they were doing um, announcing to their congregation, and black churches predominantly. And, um, and I was never a member of any church, uh, and especially the churches where they were doing the prayers for me. It's because they felt that anyone who's elected to office, if I get elected to office, it's not only good for me and my South Asian community, but it's also good for them because they will have an honest broker in elected office for their district. And that's how we do it. We make connections on, on the basis of issues. And that's what I think is the way to go. You, or, you can uh, organize your community as much as possible. But at the end of the day, it is the general masses who should be convinced that you would do the right thing by them. And that's what I suggest. Dr. Jalisi, are you sure in your medical school they didn't have uh, courses on government and politics? No, but, I, <laughs> but I, unlike Aruna, I have, um, I have family in, uh, in, in India um, who have been um, MP, who has been an MP, and then my, 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 my aunt married someone in Pakistan and he's an MA. But my own um, experience in politics was I got elected to Johns Hopkins Student Council. <laughs> but that was it. <laughs> so, that, yes, um, uh, Congressman uh, Bera has to leave uh, and for a greater cause we will just give him an applause and say thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Absolutely. I want to see more people on our panels who have to rush to vote in the House. So, you know, more power to everybody who is aspiring. Um, some very interesting things came up in your, um, in your remarks, uh, Delegate Delisi. One is that the authenticity, uh, again, the idea of authenticity of being on the ground is so critical. And it's not so critical that, they, that your voters identify with you in terms of culture or religion. You have really knocked that uh, notion out of the window to say that that is a critical part, that if people identify with you because you belong to that church, that's going to work for you. You've, your, your experience is completely to the contrary. Right. The, uh, what, you, what you and Aruna have both said um, tells me something about how important perhaps mentoring is. Because you also said in, in one case, the Democratic Party, whoever your party was or colleagues, helped and mentored and supported. In the other case, they didn't actually. Yeah. So ultimately, what mattered was that people voted for you, that the people really wanted you. And I think the other really important thing was don't stop campaigning when the campaign is over. Right. And that comes to me as, as an important takeaway for young aspirants to say, you know, there's something that goes on all the time. Don't go back to them two years later and say, you know what, hello, we were there two years ago, and now I need you back again. Because people lose interest. Attention spans are short. Memories are political memories are really short all over the world. So I think those are really important takeaways. What, what I see also as something to, to move forward and consolidate politically is also has it become important for, for, you know, this is for everybody here, we can talk in the Q&A, the importance of setting up spaces where young aspirants can actually have mentoring workshops from you, online, otherwise, virtually, yeah. whatever. What are we doing about can that? Can I add something to it? Yes, please. There's one more thing which I have learned through, through my experience, and which is not a huge, but never be ashamed of your own self or what you believe in. And during my campaign, people would call me, and, uh, and this is the Democratic primary election, so they would ask me if I would support marijuana smoking. And, you know, and I knew that 
if I said yes, the person might vote for me, and mm. if I said no, the person might not, because a large segment of the Democratic Party is, is very liberal, and they think that marijuana smoking should be legal. For me, it was not an issue, so I said no. So you have to take a stand, because people also see through you when you're mm. just saying yes for the mm -hmm. sake of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, a rabbi, a chief rabbi of a big uh, synagogue in my in my district, in my neighboring district, but has congregation in my district, called me and said, "You know, I, I like um, this program on TV called Big Bang Theory, <laughs> right? Well, most of you have seen it. It's got an Indian character, um, a, a doctor, uh, um, and and his sister Priya. So he said, I saw this episode, and you know, Priya w w is dating Leonard, another character." And I'm just explaining it to you so you understand how people sometimes misunderstand. Mm. So, you know, when, uh, when Priya does the online video chat with her, with her parents in India, she asks Leonard to go away. So is it because Indians are anti-Semitic? Mm. And I said, no. <laughs> Priya doesn't want her parents to know that she's dating Leonard because the parents would, would hit the roof, not because Leonard is Jewish, but because she's dating. <laughs> so... so, so so, you know, you, I mean, it's not that, I mean, I'm not apologizing for the culture we have. I'm just explaining it. But you have to take a position and try to explain it in the best way possible. And they understand. And so he became one of my biggest supporters. And he announced in his Congress, and, you know, we, nonprofits, whether they're churches or, or uh, Jewish synagogues, they cannot endorse a candidate. But if anyone can, and, and, and it's more so more, more important in the Jewish um, synagogues, but he was, he was just like, I'm going to endorse you. And I said, you're going to lose your nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, see what I do. He called the, his entire congregation and he said, you know, I can endorse him, but he's my best friend. So if you are going to vote for someone, you should vote for my best friend, but I'm not endorsing him. <laughs> right? But it is because I explained to him, and I did not apologize for what I believe in. And at the same time, there is always room for adjustment. And it may not be this, the answer he was looking for, but he knew that I was being, an, I was giving him an honest answer. And that's what uh, people look. Aruna will tell you there was a candidate in Montgomery County who spent like half a million dollars on a delegate race, right? Mm -hmm. And he still lost. And it's because it's not the money. It's not. Um, it's not uh, how, how fancy your, your publications are, your mailers are. It, people want authenticity. They want to know that you are the person they can send their kid to if need be or come to you at any time, and that you would at least try your level best. The results are not guaranteed, but you are guaranteeing your best effort. And I think that's what comes through. Thank you. So I think the important segue that we have now into the conversation with uh, Shekhar is um, that we've gone, the trends show that we're going beyond the ambivalences about identity. Hyphenated, I'm Indian, not Indian, can I say I'm Hindu, can I not? So every candidate is dealing with that differently and very confidently and going beyond that. And in fact, strategizing and building coalitions, which brings us exactly to the kind of work that, that um, uh, Shekhar Narsiman has been doing. He's an unusual first generation who began very early advocacy for the community to jump into to politics. Um, he's been with the uh, uh, White House Initiative on Asian Americans. And the issue really here is the issue of representation, that of the registered voters, Apparently, only 55% actually go out and vote. And the establishment of the, of the um, RP Victory Fund, what does this mean uh, for the community? And what, why should the community rally behind it? And why is it not rallying behind it? What is transformative about it? Tell us. OK, sure. For, first of all, I'm a businessman and not a politician. Um, <laughs> I have never run for office. I don't have any particular desire to do so. I just encourage others to do it, though, uh, which was going to sound counterintuitive. Um, main point of any business is to look at the facts and the data. And if you're not counted in the first place, you don't have any data. So I don't know how many of you know that before the 2000 census, um, there was no method to measure how many Indian Americans lived in the United States. You didn't know. You could guess. Mm. Uh, you could read uh, academic research, but you didn't actually know. So in 2000, what changed, and this is a process of change that occurs inside an administration, 
It's a very archaic methodology um, in the census to get a recognition symbol that said AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islanders, and then six subcategories, which started with Chinese and Indian and Vietnamese and so on, and then there's still an other. So it was the first time that we were measured. So we actually knew that Asian American Pacific Islanders in 2000 were X number, and in 2010, the growth of that community was 46%. Wow. The fastest growing minority group in the United States by 2043, over 12% of the population. Massive in terms of numbers in California, 11% of the electorate that voted on June 7th was Asian American Pacific Islander. Within that, fastest growing Indian American. So you start to see, and of course the Chinese Americans who've been here longer are the largest in number. You start to see how identity gets created. It's not often because you won't actually walk on the street and find someone who says, I'm an AAPI. Be kind of like odd wording. Uh, you do get people who say, I'm an American, which is a great thing, frankly. And I happen, my parents happen to be from India. They don't actually mostly say, I'm Indian American. So I'm beginning to think that the way we describe ourselves is kind of important, but I'm ignoring that for the purpose of politics. So for the purpose of politics, what really matters, as you know, in any campaign, and they've described it, Congressman Dara, Delegate Miller, Delegate Jalisi, it's, it's really about three things. And you often wonder whether one drives the other or not. And they've told you money matters, but it's not the most important. They're right. It does matter, though. Um, it does matter that you have field, that you have people on the ground, or you're knocking on doors yourself, or you have a message, um, and really, ultimately, you've got to get voters out to the polls. So the number of votes you get on election day actually is what counts. So if you work backwards from that one seminal issue, if you simply took all the Indian Americans in the United States that represent 1% of the population, there are about four or five precincts where it's about a third of the precinct. Indian Americans don't register, they don't vote, they talk. Seriously. Have you ever been in an Indian American crowd? We're like Italians. We talk a lot. We love to talk about politics. We actually don't play politics, though. Right. So there's a difference. The other thing we do, which I find really discouraging, is we love to have pictures taken. Now, that's a very Asian thing, by the way. That's not just Indian. Um, but it's, I, so we have a generation that grew up here that had to put its head down, as uh, Mena said, make the money, build family, build relationship, and didn't have much time for all this other civic engagement stuff. But in the process of making money, people realized that we had wealth, and politicians started talking to us about writing checks. So FYI, Asian Americans donate at the same rate as whites do politically, per capita. Ooh. Indian Americans are even higher. So yes, we are a money pit. But what have we asked in return? What have we organized to achieve? And has it been intentional? I'll try to answer those two questions and then stop. First, what have we asked in return? The first generation came here with having lived through three wars with Pakistan. So to be very blunt, it was a foreign policy perspective that was distinctly myopic. So if you took my uh, siblings, other siblings and put us in the same room and we we're talking about India, we had a particular perspective about relationships with, in South Asia. They couldn't care less. When I talk to my son about the sale of F-16s to Pakistan, he says, what is an F, what is a 16, and why do we care? <laughs> so they have a very different perspective. So there's a generational shift that has happened that we better accommodate. And naturally, in that generational shift, because they have a safety net, which is another thing I remind the next generation of. They have a safety net. They can take risks. We took incredible economic risks, uh -huh. but we didn't take the risk of exposure, politically or otherwise. They can take the risk of exposure because, damn it, they've got their folks behind them. They got a place, like my son did in the recession, to come stay in the basement. Uh -huh. uh, they can get help with a down payment. Um, so they have this advantage, but how are they using it? And have we really shifted the discussion from being counted, people knowing our numbers, people knowing where the wallets are, and how to take advantage of that? First of all, 
They have, because they're much more actively engaged. If you go to any gathering, and you saw in the White House in March or April of 2009, there were roughly 18 Indian Americans working in the White House. That disproportionate to, by the way, you know, if you looked at any numbers of any other community, sub-community, and broke it down into six categories, but it was not intentional. Most of the people that I knew didn't know those 18 people, and more importantly, didn't have a whole lot to do with their getting where they got. Oh. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is we can't legitimately expect all 18 of them to turn around and help other people like them get to the next level and grow and build. Uh -huh. I think we can expect them to. Because if you run through politics and you have to shake hands, you have to raise money, it's the same thing, by the way. An investment of time is equal to an investment of money. You should not differentiate those two. But if the community at large didn't have a whole lot to do with how people got into positions of influence and didn't support them, it should not expect in return that they're out there advocating for us or asking us what our issues are. So what we are building is a different kind of movement. We're trying to get away from this notion of segregated politics, frankly. We're talking about the Asian American Pacific Islander community as though it's homogeneous, which it is not. 42 countries, 108 languages, et cetera. If India is homogeneous, by the way, Asia is even less so, obviously. But much more importantly, we're saying 6% of the population in the six states that we're operating in, Virginia being one of them, 310,000 voters who are eligible to vote, who are Asian American. That, by the way, is roughly the same number as Hispanics. Fastest growing, grown by over 34% in terms of potential number of votes just in four years since the last presidential. If mobilized, right now they're under-registered, under-naturalized, under-registering, and under-voting. So less than 20% of Asian Americans vote, less than 15% of Indian Americans. It is simply pathetic. It's because people haven't understood the relationship between what happens here, Jay, despite all that you guys are saying. Uh -huh. How does the world change because you elect or don't elect somebody? And by not participating, haven't you already really made a decision? You've effectively voted by saying, I'm not voting. That's not acceptable in this country, in this age, with what we hear and see and understand of politics. So we're mobilizing. And it's taking a whole bunch of things. First, identifying where the voters are. Secondly, getting people who look like them to approach them. So we often have a Filipino-American who speaks a language, like Tagalog, speak to a Filipino-American. Why would it be wrong for us to run ads in Hindi and Telugu and other languages when even if it is only a small subset of voters, because those voters, believe it or not, I'm going to leave you with this example. We did our first mailing, and in tradition in North Carolina, there's a county called Wake County, which is Raleigh-Durham. There's a precinct there that's 38% South Asian. It's almost all Indian American, but there are some Bangladeshis and uh, Pakistani Americans as well. In that place, uh, there's a young man who ran named Jay Chowdhury for state senate. He ran for state senate. He's, by the way, just become state senate. He's the first Asian American uh, in the history of North Carolina. But when he ran, he assumed something. He said, boy, this precinct, 38%. Now, in a state senate race, off year, even in a presidential primary year, it's about 20% turnout. If I can just turn out my community, I look like them, I speak like them, my family lives here, just by 10 points higher, I'll win this election. So he did nine mailings to this group. He did four door knocks. So this is how you count in elections canvassing. And he did three media messages, social as well as um, through the television. 10% of them voted. We came behind him after the primary was over, and we did a messaging campaign in that same place in Wake County to Asian Americans. But we then we knew a lot more about them than he did because of data. We had found out what language they spoke because we could look at credit cards, and I hate to tell you this, but I could find out everything about any one of you just if you had a credit card. Um, we knew what kind of movies they were ordering. We knew which restaurants they went to. 
we could do a very targeted type messaging to them saying, even though you think you might have registered to vote, I don't think you actually have. Would you mind registering to vote? And then we used WhatsApp and messaging to get messages from others in the community to them. Because, by the way, one of the most important questions we ask early on is, have you registered to vote? And in every Asian gathering I've been in, 99% of the people raise their hand. Half of them actually haven't. <laughs> it's because they think they have. Because they've talked politics with their neighbors and friends, they think they're active. In that community alone, we got an 8% response rate with new registrations. So we've registered more people in Wake County, North Carolina, through very targeted, systematic methodology to register to vote. Now, I don't know how they're going to vote. That wasn't our intention. Our intention was to prove to all the larger campaigns and the parties that by spending money and resources in a very, very discreet manner, in a place that really does matter, that we could make a big difference. So that's what we're trying to do, Lena, and I hope we're successful in our six states. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll be the margin of victory in 2016. You know, More power to that. Just, yeah. just one minute. That um, I think uh, emerging from this brutal, self-searching, soul-searching for the community that you have, that you have spoken about, some um, tough talk about where to go, how to strategize, and to streamline many of the issues that have been going on mm -hmm. and people have been experimenting with individually. Because in, your, what you're suggesting is that individual successes now need to be, to be harnessed, mm -hmm. to come together, mm -hmm. and that people who won individually should not just be you know, model Indian achievers. It's time to go, you know, demolish that kind of um, perspective and move beyond. So I need to move to bring in other perspectives. Do you want to add a quick comment just now? No, or maybe no I think that I just wanted to add to what he said. It's 110% right. Um, and the 15% and the who may be registered also feel proud that they are not registered with any party, mm -hmm. which basically kills the whole purpose because most of the elections are either decided in the Republican primaries or Democratic primaries. And, and, and I give you an, a small example of my own kid. My daughter is, is, is very interested with the Bernie Sanders campaign, and she wanted to, um, to help with the campaign. And I said, but you're not a Democrat. You registered as an independent, which, by the way, in Maryland, there's no such thing as independent. It is unaffiliated. So why do you want to influence the Democratic Party politics? But it is a question which we all have to ask ourselves is, in my district, if you're not a registered Democrat, um, you, you can't help me. Uh, in her district, Aruna's district also, it's the same thing, but I'm sure there are other districts where... So when you ask people to vote, also ask them to, vote, uh, to choose a party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because just by being independents or unaffiliated, whatever it's called in your respective jurisdictions, you're not helping anyone because the decisions are made in the primary elections and the generally you're just reaffirming um, what has been decided by the parties. Right. Yeah, and I would like to also, that's, that's a lot of what I face when I face, um, come to immigrant communities. When I ask them if they're registered with a party, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm an independent. I don't want to be forced to pick a certain candidate of a certain party. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions, so I try to sit with them and talk, look, a primary, this is what happens. In the general, you can vote for whoever you want. It doesn't have to be whichever party you registered with. You leave yourself out of that process, you're leaving yourself out of the most important part of the electoral process. And as, you know, uh, Delga Jalisi said, it's not doing us candidates any good if you're not going to come out and vote during the primary. So I think there has to be some education with the community about what the purpose of registering with a party. And, you know, registering just overall is a complex process. Uh, once you, you know, go to the MVA, you've got to download a form, you've got to fill it out. So in the state of Maryland, we're trying to actually make it a lot easier to register, to make automatic registration possible. So you're not opting in you have to opt out. We didn't quite get to the um, bill and the legislation that we wanted, so people are automatically registered to vote when they uh, go get their license and other state services buildings that you go to. So we're working on that. I believe some states, like Washington State, has already done this. So, yeah. yes. So these are some of the things that we're trying to work on to make voting and registration much more easier.
Well, they would register you. as voters, not so, as the um, as a party. So they have to cho still choose the party. They still have to choose, right? Okay. So I want to move on now to call upon uh, two young people in the audience who are not Democrats, so that we can have a more nuanced discussion. Not that our conversation was necessarily only speaking about being Democrats, but I want to turn to um, Tanbir Kathawala, who is. Uh, Raise your hand and say hello to us. Yes, okay. Um, he's a millennial and a Republican. And um, so my question, um, I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about what he does. Excuse me. He's a principal and founder of Pioneer Strategies, formerly management consultant also with IBM, associate at NextGen Venture Partners, an early stage venture capitalist firm. He's also been with JP Morgan Chase, where he did some work in 2013 to do with government and public policy. Um, then we were named a global shaper by the World Economic Forum. I'm just skipping through things to flag only some of his achievements. Um, He's on the executive board. He's an executive board member of NextGen GOP and leadership MavPAC uh, member, which is a young Republican fundraising organization. So it's in that capacity that um, I requested him to add his perspective. So um, just for two or three minutes, if you would reflect, then we partly on this conversation. If you think things are a little bit different from your perspective, and what do you think is holding Indian Americans back? Should they coalesce around identity-based politics? or just issue-based? Well, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for inviting me and the Hudson Institute for putting on this uh, terrific panel. Um, I would say as a, I feel like I say this now as a Republican, I absolutely profoundly against not voting for Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> apparently that's, uh, and I think a lot of millennial Republicans kind of feel the same way. So, uh, you know, as a, you know, I think this conversation has been incredibly robust, and I think to, to delegate Miller's point, um, I think Americans, you know, I've always looked my own, uh, you know, journey as an American, having been born in this country and been a kind of first-generation American as parents came, came from, from India, is that I think the one thing I've always seen that I think being an Indian American you have in common with, what makes us, I think, uniquely um, this great melting pot is that an American, in a, your story as an American is not based on, you know, what you look like or what religion you, you're part of. That there is, there is a room in this society to be um, as American as uh, the red, white, and flag, and also, you know, enjoy Curry or Bollywood movies or, you know, have an affinity of if your, your culture that you come from. And I think it's, it's a shameful in the Republican Party that, that there has been this kind of underwritten law that if you want to be successful in Republican politics, that you must have to, you know, shed away any part of your identity, Indian identity, whether it be your name or, um, uh, you know, the cultural practices you adopt. And um, I think that the, the, the my generation really sees that there's a, there's a healthy balance too, that you can be, um, you can serve at the National Guard or you can be in movies and TV. You, there's, you know, Indian doesn't necessarily have to be the person who fixes your computer or the person who gives you your, your check seat with the doctor. I mean, it was, uh, I think, Joe Biden, he said during the 2008 election, he mm. goes to an Indian American man, he says, you know, I see you guys everywhere at every 7-Eleven in Delaware. And I think that's unfortunate that's his perspective because um, I think that as we move away from the pure identity politics, we are, are, I think we move on to a more nuanced understanding of a community that cares about issues, that votes consistently, votes in primaries, and that we're not some just monolith group because we happen to be, you know, share the last name Patel, you know, we're going to vote for you. Um, it's really, you have to cater to our issues, cater to our needs, and, and be thoughtful in that. So are there groups of, are there cohorts uh, of young Indian American Republicans like yourself? Is there vigor in that community? Yeah, so, so Next Gen GOP is a, is a Virginia-based political group, um, and the goal is, you know, I think Shaker would appreciate this, is like a lot of millennials don't register to vote, and the decisions are made in the primary process. So we, we did this big thing of like, if we registered more millennials, the, the problem in the Rep Virginia Republican Party is that, that the, the big decision that 
chooses uh, who the general election candidate for governor or senate is, is whether the party is going to have a convention or primary. And if, if it's a primary, it's generally much more a candidate who is much more mainstream that can have a legitimate chance of winning. If it's a convention, it tends to be a candidate that's a little more ideological, uh, that is may appeal to the base but does not appeal to the general election voter. So we said if in the, 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 the body that makes that decision in the Republican Party is the State Central Committee of Virginia. And we said, okay, well, that state council committee is incredibly not representative of what the state looks like as a whole. So we said, why don't we, why don't we put our own candidates up and we'll help them you know, run and, and uh, help them you know, be, kind of bring more diversity to that committee. So we thought, okay, like, this is going to be a simple process. So we figured out, like, asked them, like, what are the forms do you, does someone need to be able to run? They wouldn't give us the forms. Then they said, okay, like, you have to have these, there, these meetings that these representatives have chosen these caucus meetings in, in like, last, in, in June, and you have to have a certain number of people for a candidate to get on the ballot. I said, okay, fine. So we said, can we, can we get those reforms to register the people we want to show up to this caucus meeting? And they said, well, uh, the forms are being made. We can't give them to you and, and all that. Then they said that if, if we want any new person to register to, to go to this caucus meeting, they have to be a Virginia voter for the past like four election cycles. You have to pay an $80 new voter caucus registration fee they just made up on the spot. And then they said that uh, – <laughs> that, um, that and, and you must have a minimum of like a hundred people when the hundred people to get on the ballot, even though the the most of the members of that committee have gotten got elected with less than like fifteen votes of their little town. And so we, we kind of did this big big organization push. We kind of met all the requirements. We got three candidates elected uh, the last actually a few months ago, um, and we're we're trying to build a larger voice. That group is led, the, the most public faces of that group are, there's two other Indian Americans with me. There's a guy named Kishore Theoda, who's the executive director, and the public relations chairman of that organization is a woman named Rina Shar Bahara, who's also elected as a DC delegate for the Republican Party. Hmm. We need to have a conference with young Indian American millennials. Start a blog right away. <laughs> Uh, I would like to turn to Jay Kansara, who is from the Hindu American Foundation, does advocacy. Uh, Hindus are 51%, 51% of Indian Americans. That's the Pew figure. Um, you know, in, in March 2015, in the Atlantic, I saw this article speaking about Hindus are thriving in America, but they continue to, and that's what it said, they continue to walk a tightrope in establishing a political identity. Uh, basically, the article says voters have a hard time recognizing their names and don't identify with their religious backgrounds. And then there's a photo of Tulsi Gabba taking oath on the Gita. So I want to turn to Jack and Sarah and say, how far is this still an issue for Indian American, Hindu American uh, candidates? Thank you, Mena and Hudson Institute for hosting this and allowing me to speak uh, after such distinguished people on this panel. Um, so the Hindu American Foundation was founded in 2003 by young, primarily Indian Americans, people who were uh, young Indian Americans who were born for, uh, from parents of, who were immigrants, and even myself, I, my parents are also immigrants from India. But they had a vision that they wanted a, a voice for the Hindu American community to model that of the Jewish community. And they did it because they realized that as as they were getting married and having kids and their kids will get married and have kids that that they may not be so connected with India the way that we are because my parents are just from India so I go to India and I still have family there I'm connected but that connection may uh, may disintegrate over time but their cultural values should they choose to maintain them will will be what connects them to the broader Hindu community around the world. And also Hindus in the United States come from any country, whether it be India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka. And, and so we needed a voice that would coalesce around this. There was also just a, a, a real ignorance about what Hindus were. And Hindu, Amer uh, so our delegation went to Congress uh, several years ago, and they went to a congressman and he asked, are you Hindu Shia or Hindu Sunni? <laughs> so he insulted two religious communities at one time. And, and we realized, and that's why we created something like this HAF uh, Hinduism to go card. It's a credit card size and it has... Hinduism to go? Yeah. Wow. And it has, you know, just 50 words, what Hindus believe in, you know, a basic... And so I hand this to members of Congress. Ami Bear has been the recipient of it several times. <laughs> and as well as just creating, you know, FAQ booklets about right. who Hindu Americans are. So. I would say that 
what we try to convey to our members, meaning our, our you know, members who are paid members of HAF, as well as to members of elected office, who we don't expect all to be Hindu American or Indian American, but we, they should know that these people live in your constituencies, is that Hinduism and Hindu practices are just as American as anything else. That Hindu church, temple down the street is just as American as the church down the road. And once that, um, once that level of understanding is there within the community, they are able to become more mobilized on political issues, and, and they may be issue-based or they may be partisan-based uh, based on the, the demographics of a constituency or whatnot, but they can still be mobilized. They can be more informed, both the elected officials as well as the constituency. Right. So we know that all Indian Americans who are of Hindu extraction may not actually say, I'm Hindu American. They might still say, I'm Indian American. So um, does the Hindu American label actually become a problem when they're running for office, or it doesn't matter? Have candidates said anything about candidates or other people, appointments, whoever, in your experience? Is there other issues about a strong religious identity being asserted, xenophobia? Yes, xenophobia definitely exists, as, and, and it, 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 t it takes root at the education level. We're actually in a very uh, serious debate right now at the California State Board of Education about Hinduism, how Hinduism is portrayed in the public school textbooks. Right. But yes, religion in American politics, you cannot extract it, uh, for better or for worse. And so uh, it, it may become an issue, but what we try to portray is that Hindus, uh, you know, what, what the values that Indian Americans bring are, are primarily from a Hindu uh, or from Hindu origin, you know, assuming that they are, repre assuming that they identify as Hindu. And they should be proud of that, that these are, right. these are just as American as anything else. And if I may add, uh, plug, in, uh, plug in event warehousing, you, you, asked for, you said we should do a conference. HAF is actually hosting a conference, uh -huh. uh, our first inaugural policy conference on June 20th. So if anybody's interested in attending, uh -huh. it's here in Washington, D.C. And we'll go, we're going to delve into issues that are important to Hindu Americans, including human rights of Hindus persecuted in uh -huh. uh, South Asian countries, as well as domestic issues. And we are a nonpartisan 501c3 organization, so I do not endorse candidates from any party. So are a lot of your Hindu Americans Republican or Democrats? What's the trend? We actually, uh, even on within HAF itself, like our national team, we have a mix. Then, okay. and, they, and some Hindu Americans, like I was just speaking with Neeraj and Thani from Ohio, yes. and he identifies strongly with the Republican Party based on his, his interpretation of Hindu oh, practices Hindu. and beliefs. And I was, found that very refreshing that somebody was that thoughtful in determining their political affiliation. Now, somebody could just as easily choose the other side, and many do, but there should be that connection that I believe this, and therefore I want to associate politically this way. Right. For those of you who are not so familiar with Hinduism, I should say that um, we do not have one holy book and we do not have one particular day that we all agree we should worship on. And so it is really a philosophy that's open to interpretation. So there might be people who interpret democratic values out of it, those who interpret republican values out of it. Uh, that's a matter open to interpretation. And Hinduism is so fluid uh, and so philosophical that you don't really need to be a temple goer to be a religious Hindu. You can actually just be contemplative. So, and also that Hindu and Indian are, well, 80% of Indians are of Hindu extraction, but we have 20% of those who are others. So it's not really synonymous. It's a big number. So, yes. And, um, uh, India has the second largest Muslim population in the world. So that's our minority. That's minority. Second largest Muslim population in the world and the second largest number of Shias after Iran are not in Iraq, but in India. So do not assume that we are all Hindu. You have examples in this room. I'm fortunate to say that we are not. Uh, we are 80% Hindu, um, and we are the Republic of India. So that's to texture the conversation. Thank you very much for those perspectives. Uh, we may have run a little bit over the discussion, but we have time for questions. I will take a cluster of three questions together, and please say who you would like to address those questions to so we can be efficient. One, two, and three, and then we go this side. 
Question, please. If you'll bring the mic, uh, mic here. Gentlemen in front. Uh, yeah, OK. One question, second and third. Yes. Yeah, many um, issues were. Uh, Do you have a question? Uh, it's, it's in general. I'm, right. I'm, I'm actually running um, a campaign effort for one uh, Mary Thomas running for U.S. Congress from Second ah, District in Florida. Thank you for being here. Uh, recently, and I have done fundraisers for uh, Democrats as well in the past. Okay. One thing I notice when we go for uh, campaigning with the Indian community to raise money is the their reluctance to open their wallets is a major concern, because when an Indian is running and we have to support. They come up with uh, excuses like, okay, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, whatever, depending on the situation, in order to participate. For example, yesterday, when I was talking to somebody to raise money for Mary uh, in the second district in Florida, it's kind of a cattle country, he found out that she's supporting NRA. Yeah. And I said, okay, um, even the Democratic candidate from that district is supporting NRA, because people are running to get elected, not to make a statement. So yeah. would you rather, would Sorry you rather? to interrupt you. Could we have a question because we have people? No, no, I'm just, uh, just uh, in asking uh, these guys, you know. Yes. Have, they, have you faced, uh, you know, fundraising okay. as an issue from the Indian community okay. since they're reluctant to uh, contribute? Thank you. Basically. Yeah, we'll have a second question. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. Um, yes, okay, and then gentlemen. Hi there, thanks for a great panel. Uh, my name is Danish, I'm a freelance writer, and uh, my question uh, was more about the mentoring aspect of what you said. You talked about mentoring the youth and like the first generation of Americans. However, however, one thing I know, I'm sure you all are familiar with the, the voting dynamics in India which people grow up with. So when uh, people immigrate to India, they all of a sudden, I feel like sometimes they, they themselves the adults are in need of political socialization uh, as well because they don't really know, because uh, yeah. there's that, forgive me for generalizing, there's that notion of voting your caste instead of casting uh, your vote in India. And then uh, these immigrants are not re really familiar with the political process and nobody's really extolled the virtues of such a process to them. So do you think maybe uh, mentoring new immigrants who are also just as busy assimilating would help, uh, you know, uh, further mobilize? Thank you. Okay. Uh, question? Yes, thank you all for coming here today. And my question is for Mr. Narasimhan. Uh, so in other parts of the world, and Australia is one example, citizens face compulsory voting laws where citizens face a uh, small fine if they do not cast a vote mm -hmm. in an election. And uh, I think this introduces both solutions to a problem and possibly more problems. And I was wondering if you think that that would be a good idea for America. Wonderful. So we have a funding issue uh, to do with Indian Americans. We have to do with political socialization for first generation. I think we all agree on that. And uh, then to do with, should we make it mandatory for people to vote in any state? Go ahead, respond. Sure. Any, anyone? Yeah. I'll, I'll be happy to take on the funding issue. So yes, I do face a lot of uh, challenges when I go before the Indian American community. But having said that, the biggest percentage of campaign funding I get is from Indian Americans. Uh -huh. So oddly enough, that's how it works out. But there are situations where I think it's in our culture to always be agreeable. So when I go up to an individual, and let me tell you, as a politician, the most difficult part of being a politician is fundraising. It's very awkward. You have to get on the phone. You have to go right up to a person and say, you know, I really could use your support. Would you be willing to do a fundraiser? It takes a while to get used to that. And then you put the other person in an awkward situation as well. So in our culture, I think we tend to be very agreeable. Oh, sure, honey. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will do it. I will do it. Then I follow up with a phone call and I don't get a response back. I'll do a text. I won't get a response. But the people that have been supporting within the Indian American community have been most generous to me than anyone else I know. Other um, ethnic background groups are consistently, they give money, but a smaller percentage. But the Indian American, I notice, tend to give a larger percentage. And you know, one of the things you'll often hear in campaigning is that signs don't matter. Let me tell you something, signs do matter. You know, winning a campaign is a million little things. So when I first ran, I was a totally virtual unknown person. I had a sign, of course, with my name on it. 
and I had an Indian American that recognized the first name as being Indian American, but the last name didn't quite sound Indian American. Mm -hmm. So he went back, looked my name up on the website, and he's like, oh, she does look Indian American. Next thing you know, I get a big check from him. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't something that I went and lobbied for, solicited, but ended up getting it. So I think part of the you know, issues with Indian Americans and fundraising is, again, they don't quite get the connection why they need to support a certain candidate and what's in it for them. Some get it, but a lot of them don't right now. So I think that's you know, something that we have to work on. So thank you. Mandatory voting laws, how about that? Who wants to go for that? I could respond. Um, we've actually studied um, why voting trends in the United States have shown a decline in the voting percentages over, by the way, it's over 35 years now. Um, it, one is that we have a lot of elections. And I think we just it, we sort of frame that in a way to say in Virginia, we have an election every single year. And the percentage of votes that are cast in a presidential race are the highest in a uh -huh. presidential year. And then it declines almost precipitously. Um, it's hard to participate when there are that many elections. So that's one reason why voting participation has changed. The second is that with, uh, in the Asian American Pacific Islander community, 74% of the people are immigrants and foreign born. And there's a lot of languages. There's, so there's language access issues. South Asians have it less so, but it's not, it's not a zero sum issue because not, people, not, people, not everyone reads this proficiently in English. You've seen huge advances in this country in Spanish translation for ballots, for literature. You don't see that in other languages yet. We're making that transition to saying other languages also matter. Um, if a few million people speak a different language, they should be addressed in those languages. Not just campaigns, but I'm talking about the, the methodology and f of a ballot, um, of the way that literature is handed out and given to you on how do you register to vote, how do you get a license. These need to be language accessed. Today, we live in a world of technology where you know there's a Google translator, and you could theoretically take every government form and translate it. So how do you encourage people to vote how do you make it easier for them to vote? It should really be the issue as opposed to mandating it. Um, there are some states where it is difficult to vote, oh. and it is made deliberately so. Mm -hmm. So all those of you that care about this issue of how do you increase civic participation should care about the fact that you have to go and elect delegates. You have to be in participating in the whole issue of what are voter rights. Um, and rather than saying that you know, if you don't vote, um, there'll be a fine, which I think in the United States would be almost impossible to get done. Um, on fundraising, um, I've been fundraising uh, theoretically uh, with Indian Americans for uh, politics since 1984. Since Mondale, I'm aging myself. I have not found Indian Americans to be very different in terms of raising money than pretty much any other group, frankly. The only group that has seen an existential threat and rights checks because they see exist in shell threats are the Jewish uh, community. That's the only group where they understand. It's almost like tithing in a different way. But no other community, um, except when faced with that kind of an existential threat, writes checks because they think, if I write a check, it makes a difference, and I, my children will be differently served. The Indian American community has faced no such threat. Now, that's not to say we don't have issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the highest per capita income, but we also have a 9% poverty rate. Mm -hmm. People don't seem to know that. Mm -hmm. There are 400,000 undocumented uh, yeah. overstays, uh, Indian, in the United States uh, today, who are totally in the shadows. So we have issues. If you can translate issues and educate people, you can get people to write a check, but they still want a return on investment. Now, return on investment in the United States isn't getting a lucrative contract, hopefully. Um, it's much more about access, getting your issues, and having a seat at the table. And if you can educate people on what those things are, I have found a very loyal group of donors, and we actually seed fund candidates um, that don't appear to have even a prayer of winning, because the assumption is if they lose once, they'll get up and run again. So there is, a, I think, a group now of angel investors in the Indian American community. You're going to have to find them 
and they may not support the politics of your candidate or her party or otherwise. Um, all the polling we're doing says that, like other, many other communities of color, um, APIs and Indian Americans are leaning Democratic much more heavily. And it, you know, it's really up to the other party and their candidate to fix that. We, I can't you know, fix it for you. Uh, you have to fix that problem yourself. So interesting things here about, uh, to your point about political socialization and also about seed funding, the new trend uh, and its consolidation about seed funding candidates and angel investing. And I want to just for a moment call upon Anurag, who's been working with the organization of hoteliers. So take one minute to tell everyone so we can follow up your work, maybe on online or something, to say what the Hoteliers Association are doing with this pact they have formed. They have 15,000 members. Uh, they own 45% of all the hotels in the United States. Oh. Um, and this thing about um, existential threats and money, they feel that their industry is under attack. Oh. So they have raised half a million dollars in their own pack. And this year, their actual goal is to exceed $1 million in their political action committee. Uh, money for candidates. Bipartisan? Uh, bipartisan, but they lean Republican. Okay. They, uh, they are nonpartisan, actually, but if you were to talk to them, mm -hmm. they lean heavily Republican. Um, and, their, and their PAC spending is probably two to one, Republican, Democrat. Um, but, but so when we talk about our community, there are slices mm -hmm. that don't fit. So first of all, the whole panel has been amazing, and I've been in politics 19 years I mean, it's, you hit all the notes, right? But one of the, one of the notes I want to mention is there are slices, like the hoteliers, right, that don't fit the model, mm. right? A fifth of our population, a Shaker uh, Indian American in this country, are the new immigrants, um, the, you know, the folks who maybe came here on H-1Bs, right, um, in the last 10 years that are my age and younger. The tech. Right? I mean, invisible in a different way. Um, I mean, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots happening. There's lots of slices. Your panel is only an hour and a half. I mean, we should probably stay till four. Um, but <laughs> Next will be our conference, half a day on the millennials and beyond. So two quick questions from this side, so I don't neglect anyone. Quick question. Sorry, no time for comment. Yeah, thank you. And to whom? Yeah. Uh, this is for anyone on the panel who wants to address it. Sanjeev Joshipura, I'm working right now with an organization called Indiaspora, and we are on our way to being the next Davos of the global Indian community in 10 years' time. But uh, my question for the panel is, and it's been a great panel, uh, as uh, Anurag said, my question is, as has been spoken about before, it seems to me, and Shekhar may know the numbers better than me, but about 75 to 85 percent of Indian Americans tend to vote Democratic, I've read before. When there is this lopsided of voting for one community for one party, the concern I have is that both parties might end up taking that community somewhat for granted. In one case because you're always going to vote for them, in the other case because you don't matter because there are too few of you. Any thoughts about how we can solve that issue, solve that problem of not being taken for granted by both parties? Okay, question. One more, something else? All right, good. So we can the, the very quick answer to that is that it wasn't always the case. So it can change. Uh, Vietnamese Americans is an example that came uh, as boat people in the 1970s, 1975, were heavily Republican and voted and trended Republican for a long period of time. In the last 12 years, they've trended Democrat. And it's now gone from you know, 20, 80 to 60, 40 Democratic. You cannot take any community for granted, mm -hmm. especially one as heterogeneous as the Indian American and the Asian American communities. You better work hard, you better message, you better touch the issues, and you better touch their pockets for investments. Otherwise, you can't own them. I would just like to add, um, I think you're seeing this uh, for two reasons. One is, as a person of color and a minority, um, myself and other people who look like me, feel that the Democrats at this time and age connect more with the minorities. And that's why you see us getting confused when we see people like Donald Trump getting the nomination of the Republican Party, who is against women, against Mexicans, against Hispanics, against every conceivable minority group. And so that is a big hindrance. But like he said, it's not written in stone. And when I, I think about till 
I would say 10 years ago, but even sometimes it's true, um, uh, that people who came, immigrated to this country, um, the diaspora, if you will, came with their own um, image of things which were important for them. So um, somebody said that when people immigrate to America, they, it's like a snapshot of what their country was at that time when they left it. <laughs> And so every time they go back, they try to find the same, the same problems and the same benefits. When they come here, they treat everything else, including politics and support of, of different parties the same way. So somebody who is a 70-year-old um, uh, Indian who came 30 years ago would probably always remain a Democrat. Uh, somebody who's a 70 or 75-year-old immigrant from Pakistan will probably always be a Republican because their snapshot in their memory is what the Republicans did for, the, for where they came from back then. Now, it doesn't mean uh, it's the same is true for their kids. Uh, the kids who have been brought up here, raised here, they're as American as everyone else, and they deal with the issues. Who's going to be good for their education, for jobs, for student loans and whatnot? And if the Republican Party or the Democratic Party deals with it appropriately, they would be their voters. And I think that's what the Republican Party and the Democratic Party needs to uh, worry about. So I'd just like to add, it's Sanjeev? Sanjeev, that's a great question. So I'm going to break it down to a very microscopic level. As a candidate, when we run for elections, the first thing we look at, we have a database of all the registered voters in our district. It's broken down to either Republican, independents, or Democrats. Let me tell you something. When you, it, with my party as a Democrat, we look to see who are the Democrats, how many times have these Democrats voted in a primary for the past 10 years. We call them super Dems. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that we focus on. Those are the ones we send all the mailers to, the phone calls to, because we know they will consistently come out and vote. We do not take any vote for granted. We do not take any block of voters for granted when you break it down to that microscopic level. Every vote counts. Those are the people we focus on. And this is why I tell our community that please get out and vote during the primary, because if you want to get the ear of a local elected official, this is the way to do it. Yes, you can do it by contributing. Yes, you can do it by volunteering, putting a yard sign up. But this is the most important way to do it, is by voting. So I don't think that we take anything for granted of a certain group. In my own community, we have a high percentage of Jewish American population. And they get out and vote every single time, as Shikar said. And let me tell you, we put our entire focus on the issues that matter to them, because right. we know that they come out and support us by getting out and voting. So. You know, to that, that being said, that I don't think we take it for granted. So I think it's a perfect moment to wind up and start uh, sort of go away with what we've uh, had from, from the wonderful comments here from the panelists who've spoken as strategists, who've spoken about personal experience and a broader, bigger picture view uh, from uh, Congressman Ami Bera. Uh, one of the things that we didn't have a chance to talk um, more about was how the millennials, both Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. can be, in fact, um, mentored, coached, persuaded with a targeted sort of way within the community at different levels, at local levels maybe, to become those super Dems and super Republicans. Because now you're looking at those who are, but how do you make them? Because that's a step forward. And the other thing is the question that came, that the reference that came up, which was to do with the Jewish American community. There were at least five references that came up. I didn't mention that. It's something I've been working on quite a lot. But it came up in the discussion. And I want to draw uh, people's attention to that, that that is something that comes up in many, many uh, Indian community discussions, to see that community politically having organized, mobilized, and lobbying for, for, their, for their candidates and so on as a model in political assertion, in political organization. I think there are many reasons why Indian Americans cannot take on that model template wholly, but that's for another conference, another conversation. Thank you for being here.